Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth act. My name is Sadiq Ali. I'm a serial entrepreneur and, among other things, I'm currently the founding team member as well as the CTO and CPO of AccuCardia, an ECG analytics company based out of New York City. In this series, I'll be chatting with other entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, engineering leaders, and innovators that are helping shape the future of key industries, in particular financial services, sustainability, healthcare, and education. Our guest in this video is Caroline Hargrove. Caroline is a very accomplished CTO and has worked for some of the world's elite brands, startups, and educational institutions. Caroline is currently the CTO of Ceres Power. Ceres is a leader in climate technology and is setting the pace and standards for solid excite technology, a key transition technology as we look to move towards a cleaner, more sustainable planet. Ceres trades publicly on the London Stock Exchange and currently has a market cap of nearly a billion pounds. Prior to Ceres, Caroline was the CTO of Babylon Health. Babylon is a global telehealth pioneer, enabling easy access to GPs, physiotherapists, nurses from any mobile device. Babylon trades on the New York Stock Exchange and has a market cap of over $250 million. Prior to Babylon, Caroline was the CTO of McLaren Applied Technologies, where she honed her technical chops and her leadership skills for over a decade. Caroline began her industry career developing simulators for McLaren Racing, which interestingly was where Lewis Hamilton would hone his racing skills before he was even legally allowed to drive in the UK. Caroline has also been in academia and has been a professor and lecturer at both Oxford and Cambridge. Cambridge is also where Caroline received her PhD in engineering. This series is brought to you by Archimedes, a curated global software engineering guild. Archimedes believes that the future of work is here and it goes well beyond remote work. The zenith of industrial age work was essentially reached at the end of the 1990s and culminated with large multinational corporations around which most knowledge work was organized and facilitated. Archimedes believes that the best way forward in the information age is a return to the not so distant past where guilds and not companies were the key organizational entities around which work was facilitated. The Archimedes Guild is centered around software engineering and digital product development related skills. We have shared relevant links to either join the guild or work with the guild in the description of this video. Without further ado, here's my conversation with the brilliant and inspiring Caroline Hargrove. Hi Caroline, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm really excited talking to you today. I, I know when we, we last spoke, it was, it was in person. This is something that I've gotten very used to as well over the last two or three years, uh, you know, doing podcasts and meeting people over Zoom as well. So I'm sure this will work just fine. Wanted to, you know, talk to you, frankly speaking, on this podcast ever since uh, I first got to know you because, I, you know, just find your your entire journey, um, you know, very, very fascinating, particularly, you know, how you, in some sense, um, gone from, you know, very different industries over over the course of your career you know, would love to just learn a little bit more about that if you, you know, don't mind just talking us through your journey as an engineering leader from in the various organizations and the different type of organizations you've worked in from automated all the way through to clean tech. Can you just walk us through that? Because I think that is really, really, really fascinating. Yeah, you, you make it sound like it was a plan. <laughs> <laughs> no. So one thing I can... it's it's hard to be planned, right? With something like exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 I don't yeah. think you can plan this. Yeah. But but I think it's it's one of those uh it it's it's grabbing opportunities along the way. I I actually uh, grew up in Montreal and wanted to learn English. So I went to a university not in Montreal, so I could really learn English and it, it immerse myself. So I went to Queen's University in, in Ontario and then decided that actually I wanted to travel and wanted somewhere else which brought me to the UK and I got a scholarship and I, I did my PhD at Cambridge. And it's what, one of those things where um, one thing leads to another. And, and when you when you start doing academic work, then, then I got a uh, you know, research fellowship and I got a lectureship, but I realized it wasn't for me. You know, it's, it, it, you're in a, in a weird position where you're in a job that a lot of people would like to have. Academics would really like to be there and do this. And I thought, but that's, I want to work in industry. <laughs> So I felt in, a, in this kind of sort of way, but I liked the theoretical aspect, but but I wasn't cut out. I, I didn't think to do university research, or at least not immediately. So I, it's just serendipity. I, I just looked into a magazine and saw that um, that there was a job advert for people doing simulation in Formula One, and uh, and I thought, well, I can do simulation. <laughs> 
in in dynamics, you know, okay, I've never done Formula One cars, but you know, how difficult can that be, right? So, uh, so I, I, it just again one of those things where it's it's not that not that many people like the the mathematical aspect of engineering, which I which I do. So, I I, I got the job there um, and knew some of the people there because there were people with similar background to me. Then one guy had done a PhD with me, and therefore. He had recommended me, which I didn't know, and he wanted to move to to the U.S. Anyway, so it's just one of those things where you land with a job, and and I loved it. I loved working at McLaren. We did so many cool stuff. Like I I did ten years in Formula One, where we we actually did race strategy. We did, and then we started building simulators. So I got really involved in the simulators and building a Formula One simulator from scratch. We never that. It didn't exist, and a lot of people didn't think it was ever going to work. Because why? Um, how can it be? You know, it's such a, a a very intense experience. It's not like driving a normal car, and it's not like a like a a normal air, airplane, which you have plenty of simulators for. Because this is quite a low frequency response for a Formula One car. It's much more like a jet fighter. And in the end, we uh, we still <laughs> we still plowed on, and and you know, I I. For a long time, I used to think I have the best job in the world. Like, yeah, I like I kept thinking this is so good because it's every day was a different challenge. We we're trying to do, we're trying to fool a driver to feel that they were driving a Formula One car and yet they were in a small room in the dark and walking. Right, and it, it was very interesting. And it was not a, not a video game, of course. Video games have improved a lot, but but we had to get every item right for a, a driver, and the drivers are enormously perceptive to their environment and their and their feeling on their body and so on and and through that I started exploring how the brain responds to these to these stimulation and I got really fascinated by the that that kind of I guess the neuro aspect of it and and then over time we uh, we you know it, 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 although it's really good then then you start thinking well you know, okay I've done it for a few years and we decided that we'd start this this other business at McLaren, which would exploit some of the Formula One technology into other areas. And I was the third person to say, you know, Mimi, please, can I can I join? And uh, so the three of us that started this, um, it it coincided. It was in two thousand eight when um, we were starting to get ready, as in we generally a country trying to get ready for the twenty twelve Olympics in London, and. We got involved with a number of sports and again, through some chance conversations like we're having now, I'm talking to people who in sports. Anyway, we got involved in supporting a number of sports as well as doing some more, some more sort of um, more fee paying uh, projects in, involving, again, lots of simulators. But through that, got involved with human performance. And I found that really fascinating. And then that got me working also with Oxford on uh, on simulations for surgeons. So there's a lot of links that over the years that kind of went from one thing to another and it, everything is linked from what you've done before to, to move you into another thing and to another thing and then got into involved because doing a lot of simulation, then AI is quite close to that. And, and, and the data analysis morphs into AI over these years and, and then when I felt that my time at McLaren had been very fun and very interesting, and we built the, the technology business to 600 people all organically, and it was, it was good fun, good work uh, all along. Uh, at one point, you reach a stage where you need to move on and do other things. And so I thought, well, I I like health and I like the planet. I want to to, to try to, to be involved in a, in a clean tech but. I had more health experience actually through through this work, at least the engineering side of it, than I had the clean tech experience. But I got again through um, through connections and so on. Found out there was this company called Ceres who was looking for um, board members, and certainly a board member that was technically um, um, competent, if I could say that, um, because one of their board members uh, that was their technical uh, advisor was uh, retiring. And and I joined that board and realized I really liked that company. They they're working on fuel cells um, at the time, only fuel cells at the time that I joined. But it's 
the idea was trying to be towards the net zero agenda and so on. So it was a good way of learning what they were doing. And in, in parallel, I joined Babylon, um, which was a, a health tech company that was growing at you know, rapid pace. And their idea was to try to give a lot more bandwidth to, to GPs by using AI and trying to do kind of primary care really well so that it would decongest things further down. So anyway, got to that and worked on that for a few years up until COVID hit. And then of course, it, that's a, that was a bit of a, a, a complete re, re, reprogramming of so many businesses. I'm sure it happened the same in your business setting in your businesses, but it, it certainly in Babylon, it had this weird effect that rather than working on generally health and jet, people just wanted to focus on COVID and it, it, it was hard for us at the time because suddenly people, unless it was just COVID, they, they weren't interested the most because that was the top priority. And, and at the time there was some money being put in for, for companies in the US, especially because of COVID and, and, the, and the, the healthcare area. And so the, the, the leadership, the, so the, the chap who started Babylon, um, Ali Parsa, he decided that he, he wanted to go after this funding in the US and he essentially moved the company to the US. It's, that wasn't for me, I, I didn't want to do that. Um, so I decided that I would, I would move on and do something else and got involved in a very small med tech. But at that point, um, the CTO at, uh, at Ceres, he just was, Pretty well burnt out. Like that's the problem when you work very, very hard. And because I was on the board, I knew about this, and we had lots of discussions with the CEO. And asked me whether I would want to step in. And I'm not an electrochemist, and this is a company about electrochemistry. But but ultimately, we have a lot of brilliant electrochemists, and what they want to also to do is start to looking at doing more simulations and and starting to do things in a more um, digital way, if I can say, because it's very much a trial and error area even today. Um, and because there's a lot that happens that people don't quite understand yet, the characterization of what's happened at every layer. So it's, it's you know, chemistry is, is difficult, but in, and that's at the nano level because we're talking about movement, very small movements of ions and, and in, impurities and different combinations that happen. So it it's, fascinating and I'm learning every day but I've only been in that post now one year so you can imagine it's a journey that I didn't think I was going <laughs> to yeah do if you uh, asked me this when I was 18 but there you go <laughs> yeah no fascinating I just have a couple of few um, follow-up questions um first really um and, and this is relevant because a lot of people are in a similar junction in their career where they are considering the road um, between academia and industry, um, it sounds like you 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 knew fairly quickly that you wanted to 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 pursue industry. Was there a particular trigger for that, or you know what was what what was the what was the driver in some sense if there was one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good question, so like because I think it was mainly the fact that I find it difficult not to put a lot of effort into teaching if you're. So if you've got people in front of you, it's yeah. pretty, pretty compelling. You want to do a decent job. And if you want to do that and and do all your research, there's quite a lot of effort to put it into this. And I felt, I know the balance has changed over time, but I felt the teaching was was not appreciated in, in your performance. And it was, you were only, you were only judged on research and publication. And yet the teaching was what was especially when you're a young lecturer when you joined to give, <laughs> to give you mm-hmm. quite a bit of teaching um then it felt like you you got a lot of feedback the immediate feedback from the from the students is there and in Cambridge you, you've got a lecture and you do supervision so you, you're quite involved in the teaching but but it didn't really count on anything. So you end up working every single hour of every day to do, to get some research grants um, and then to, to to do it because you feel like that's what you're going to be judged on. And, and 
for me, I know that people who've been there longer said, don't worry, eventually you just teach with your eyes closed so you don't worry mm -hmm. about it. But I so didn't like the idea of just... At some level, right? Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's and just, for some, they yeah. just take it in their stride. But for me, I felt, I think, I found that quite yeah. hard and and not as fulfilling because yeah. I prefer to give my all to essentially one yeah. job. Um, and so weirdly, I found moving to McLaren actually easier because I found I could give all my time to this one 100%. thing. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. I never heard that before, but I can definitely see that because I've been, you know, I I remember even through undergrad and in particular when I was studying engineering as well, you, you knew the professors that cared more about teaching was the ones that cared more about research and you sort of... Uh, you know, you wanted to be with the ones that cared more about teaching from the point of view of learning. Uh, but, you know, it was very hard at that point, at least for me to put myself in the shoes um, of the professors that were more focused on research, because, you know, that wasn't what you do as an undergrad, right? So you look at things from your perspective, but that, that's a fair point and a very interesting point. Just another quick question on on your your time at McLaren, particularly with the simulation there. Were, other, were some of the other Formula One race teams also starting to do simulations around the same time or or was McLaren ahead of the curve a little bit at that point I'm pretty sure we, we were certainly ahead of the curve on the simulators so we, yeah. we 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 invested more in earlier in simulation than other teams but it, Formula One world is a very uh, uh, closed shop world where people yeah. move from one team to another Between so teams, quickly yeah. gets yeah. Yeah. yeah, the word gets around. So you don't publish, you don't e even go for patents because because you're trying to keep a secret right. as long as right. possible. More tra trade secrets, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And but it's it it got it caught up, but it, it took a little while because there was a fair amount of learning, and we actually had patents, interestingly. And simulator is the only thing we ever went for patent for, but didn't mean anything because we didn't try to then chase anyone else. Um I'm not entirely right. sure why we even bothered, to be honest, but we did use the this the simulator commercially. So we built another one. So when we built the technology business, I ran another simulator that we ran with other Formula One teams for a while, very lucratively, I can I can add, um, mm -hmm. until the, these teams started until beating McLaren their own. on track. Yeah. <laughs> At which point uh, Ron Dennis pulled the plug. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this this were you there around the time when I guess Lewis Hamilton started racing for McLaren because I know he switched oh, to Mercedes. Oh yes, Lewis after a while. came to the yeah. simulator. Yeah. His dad used to drop him off in the simulator because he couldn't drive on the road yet. He yeah. didn't have his road. His you know, drive. he wasn't seventeen yet. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, you know you're dealing with a prodigy at some level. I mean, they all are, right? Like I think all of the ones. Yeah. I mean, it's just only so many that make it to these Formula One teams, and uh, there must be something special about them to get there in the first place. Um, but anyways, um, sort of moving on to a slightly, I guess, more uh, fun topic at some level, but I think equally important from the point of view of especially, you know, the, the our audience is just, you know, you interestingly worked at Cirrus for a while as a as an advisor, if I if I um, recall correctly, prior to becoming more of a you know full time executive uh, CTO. There is that something that. I, I, was it planned or was it something I'm, I'm assuming it was it wasn't but you know what, what was the thinking behind that was it just because it was a new space you wanted to observe it from the outside for a bit before you get fully ingrained you know yeah I didn't know how I would how I would go into that area I, I really wanted you know I, I think most engineers you, you look at the world and you think well you either want to be in in health or in in clean tech or, or climate tech, whichever you want, way you want to call it, because they're the two things we've got to tackle now. You know, it's it's not tomorrow, it's now. And many, mm -hmm. uh, many, many technologies need to be applied. And I didn't have that. I wasn't sure what, in which area was most, that would be most suited for and so on. And again, it's one of those things where you get involved in a company and you realize, I like the people. So uh, it wasn't it wasn't planned because I didn't think I had the the uh, although we have you know we have mechanical engineers because you have to 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 um, put the put the system together right. and so on the the 
the IP is more in the chemistry in the in the, in the material science than than actual um, engineering. But ultimately, running technical teams from there, when you when you become a certain size, and we're we're now almost six hundred people. So when I first joined on the board, it was two hundred. So that's in four years, it's it's 200%. gone quite big. Yeah, 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 and it and it's it when you reach a certain size when you're a, a technology leader you don't do so it doesn't matter that i i don't you know that i don't yeah. know the electrochemistry um per se but i you realize that you know technology has to run its course in a certain way and what you really got to do is is spot spot all the the critical things trying to remove blockers trying to bring people together trying to make connections you work a lot at trying to make that technology the technology program work and, and you have trusted people who know and they're experts in this to run each one of the programs. But often you're the one connecting that program with that program and making sure people talk to each other and so on. So it becomes very much a an orchestration for the technology, I think. Um, and it probably more so that I mean, if I'd been an electrochemist, uh, maybe I would get involved more. But I'm not sure that that would <laughs> that would necessarily be helpful because we we have experts, have experts in, this, in and, those areas. Yeah, yeah, and they need to grow. And and it was just that we hadn't really grown the next CTO in that company yet. But I have no doubt that with the talent that we have, my successor is is there in a the company. You know, but but we need to just give people an opportunity to. To develop the the leadership skills going from being either an engineer or a scientist or uh, yeah to to become um a, a leader and, and for that as you know part of it is an opportunity but part of it is also the sort of what you're interested in and whether you it, you want to be defined by finding the next pattern that is amazing that will really propel the the technology further or whether you you like doing the plan and the and the uh, the organization and looking at people development and you know, looking at building a technology company that will sustain this and at one point all of us managers that were highly technical before you make that transition and and not everyone likes that because you choose to be an engineer because mm -hmm. you like doing something and you like the you like being proud of what you've achieved and when you're one <laughs> one yeah. step removed from that which i am now at times it's frustrating i honestly almost every day i feel itchy that sometimes i should write a bit of oh, you know, i should write yeah, something some, like a yeah. code or something to solve yeah. because i'm hearing a problem i think maybe i should get into this like no 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 you know it's not yeah. me i'm not good enough at <clears> this now and so on but yeah. that's it's what I used to do, and therefore it kind of comes out, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I know. It's I I totally see that as well. I think the 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 one thing the, the way you described it sounds to me like for sure there's there were transferable skills between what you've been doing all along, you know, at Babylon through the series. In terms of clean tech itself, as you mentioned, right, like particularly with with uh, with series. Uh, if actually, if you don't mind just describing a little bit more about what Sirius is, I have a, a question that I'll, I'll ask right after that. But if you don't mind just quickly describing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, if people are aware of what a fuel cell is, it, it mm -hmm. transforms you know, a basic hydrogen fuel cell will take the hydrogen and through uh, passing um, it, the hydrogen fuel cell will create electricity from mm -hmm. a chemical process. Okay, so that's the, you, you have air on one side and hydrogen on the other, and you will create, uh, and water as a byproduct. So it's a clean way of producing electricity. Now, it, it's not particularly efficient if you, um, if, if you need to produce your hydrogen as well. So one of the things that is useful in some of the technology like ours is that it, it can take other things than hydrogen, something that contains hydrogen, like ammonia, or um, which is okay because there's no carbon, but you can also use natural gas and collect the, the CO2. But even without collecting the CO2, because you don't burn the, the, uh, the fuel, the natural gas, you produce a third less CO2 anyway. 
and you don't produce the, the, the NOx and the SOx that are harmful to breathe. Um, mm -hmm. So from a from a air quality perspective, so it is a transition technology. In many areas of the world, for example, use coal like India. India mm -hmm. they use coal everywhere. And that's mm -hmm. that's how you, you produce power in India because they don't have sources of natural gas. So they they are moving to importing natural gas, and using fuel cells is a way to get there until there's enough hydrogen that they can move to hydrogen. And these technologies are useful to do the transition. But more interestingly is that you can reverse the process entirely by, by using green electrons. So from hopefully windmills or, um, or solar power, like um, in, a, in a hot country, you'd be able to bring green electrons. And in our technology, it's steam rather than water. You, you bring steam. So in an industrial application, you may have waste steam that you can use and you produce your, your hydrogen this way. So this the only way at the moment that exists to do green hydrogen is to do it via electrolysis. Now, the technology that we've developed is just a lot more efficient than a lot of the existing electrolyzers that are out there, but not enormously scale this is very new and green hydrogen everyone wants it but it will take a while there's just not enough supply i mean it we, to be fair I'm, I'm comparing different applications but we need all of them out there there there's we will not meet the demand of hydrogen at the rate that we're going so we need to produce a lot more but our technology we don't commercialize it directly we license it and we chosen this licensing model because that's a much faster way to scale. And frankly, we weren't very good at doing the manufacturing no. as well as doing the R&D that is quite complicated to do. So we decided that let's stick to one thing and we'll do the, 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 the basic chemistry and material science to get to constantly improving the product itself. But we'll let the, you know, Big industrialists like Doosan. So at the moment, we've got Doosan in Korea, we've got Bosch in Germany, and WeChai in China, who are licensees of our technologies. And, and they're building factories to make it and build a system around it and sell it under their name. But for us, it's a bit like ARM in, in the, the business model. And it allows us to actually have a much greater impact because for these guys, it's useful because they... The leapfrog, if they were to start today developing that technology, it would take them years. So by licensing it from us, they can fabricate it and become Time one to market, of their... It's much shorter. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. they can, it, they, they'll market it as a Bosch product or they'll market it as a Doosan product, which is fine because we'll, we'll have royalties on each one. So at the moment, yeah. the factories are being built, but they won't be, there won't be anything coming out until the end of 2024. That's so we've got another two years before those factories are built and produce and start production. That's interesting. And actually, my, my question was related to really the um, the transition from because both, um, I guess, less so with McLaren, but Babylon. And I think the company you worked with uh, right after that, Zetson, both were very software driven companies at some level. Right. And in your current organization, um, to your point, it's very chemistry and, and material science driven. Um, was Is that the biggest sort of engineering uh, leap in some sense that you have to get your, your head wrapped around? Or are there other things about working as a CTO of a clean tech company that are different um, from working at you know any of the other type of companies that you worked in before? The biggest thing I've got to get used to is the fact that if you're dealing with electrochemistry, everything takes a long time to develop. And if you come from Formula One, this is at times I get I get really you know frustrated by the pace at which we can go. Now, there's only so much you can do because ultimately, if you want to test whether a certain chemistry will will be better than another one, over it is. It never, well, that's not true. It, obviously it has to work from the start, but normally it's 
what we're mainly worried about is will it work over a long period of time? And although we're doing some modeling, you still need to run it for quite a period. So if you want to say your product has to work for 40,000 hours, then it has to work for 40,000 hours. You can't accelerate that. That's enormously frustrating for me um, because I'm desperately trying to find ways of, of getting more, getting a faster feedback loop. But I think we are getting better at doing this. And this is where AI comes in, actually. And I know that you're passionate about that as well. And it, it's being able to, to bring in some new techniques that will help us explore, say, rather than doing it all manually of, of trial and error of different materials, different dopants in a, in a, in a chemistry in order to, to, to give it different properties. So sometimes you want to make it more um, resistant to poisons. Other times you want to give it more life. Um, generally, like robustness through for, from thermocycling because because the, the fuel cells, at least our ones, which are solid oxide ones, are quite at high temperature. You've got to make sure that when you start it and slow it down and so on, it, it's resistant. So all those things, they're, we're desperately trying to find ways of, of, of getting predictions through um, either modeling, but also through AI. Now, the AI bit, we're doing baby steps here, but we're trying to, um, we're working with universities and trying to come up with ways of, of exploring um, the material space and see whether we can um, make or give AI the, the task of looking at different molecules and different um, at the nano level and seeing whether we could have better performance using different materials. And because there's many different combination of this, we think it's a good problem to do with AI, but it's also very unbounded. And AI is not very good yet at, at unbounded problems, right? So um, hence, it's this is baby steps. It, this is gonna take a few years, but we have to plant the seeds now because that's what's gonna help us into, into the future, no doubt. I'm starting to mute, but the combination of things that you're working on um, a super interesting to me at least because when when I was you know, studying engineering myself, the two things that fascinated me most were you know, I actually was debating between being a materials engineer or a computer engineer because I, I, I really enjoyed you know materials engineering as I just took some some introductory courses but they were very very fascinating because ultimately I think as much as we operate in the world of bits and bytes, um, you know it's it's. Uh, the the world that the challenge that faces the future today is one of atoms and molecules, right? So unless we get that right, we are going to have um, a fairly difficult future in front of us. So I mean, I, you know, very fascinated and also I highly res respect what you're doing because it's um, it's it's I think the key problem of 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 the current century that uh, uh, that that you're you're helping solve. Now, in terms of you know one other sort of common thread I've I've noted in your various uh, transitions as well as the, you know the companies that you worked at in particular it's you know it's, it sounds to me at least from an outsider's perspective that these are all very high performing they have to be at some level very high performing teams that you you're working with how do you you know is there is there sort of a secret sauce of pre key set of ingredients that that comes together to put together a very high performing team because frankly speaking right i am the firm believer that in the world that we're moving towards capital at some level is fungible and is you know to some degree a commodity but talent is not and to get talented people is obviously a big part of it but then having those talented people work together and work together effectively and efficiently is 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 probably even more important so you've obviously been able to do that and across multiple organizations and multiple industries but you know what are some of the things that make that possible what are some of the things you as a leader have to think about and put in place so that you can do that mm -hmm. it's a very good question and i think one one really, really important ingredient is to have the mission right. So what motivates people, what gets people out of bed? Because in Formula One, it was a race. There's another race and there's another race. And it's very visible. And if you if you screw up, it's very visible. And if you win, it's also in a... So it it's a, becomes a bit of a drug you know, when you have that because you, you become addicted to the fact that there's another race and then, oh, let's just keep going. Let's make this. And... It takes a specific type of people to like that because it's pretty relentless. You, you go there and then you get 
you get a little break and during that little break of races you're preparing the next car so it, it is quite relentless but but people are so driven and actually what i like series is the same thing people are really driven because they want to do something about the climate and they feel you know they know something about materials they, they're they, or they're experts in chemistry or in, in systems engineering or so on and they want to make a contribution to uh, to a technology that will be one of many uh, that we need to implement as soon as possible to solve the climate crisis. So you feel you're doing something in the right direction. And I feel that's solve problem number one is that you, you get motivated people towards the cause. So that's the one thing. And then the next one to me is having people who it's not about them, but it's about what you're trying to achieve. And there's some people who are amazing and but they don't make it all about them. And when you start working with people that are like this, it's so much fun because you 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 feed off each other. And and it's 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 important. So I've actually had to let go of people or or haven't hired people who I knew were really, really bright, but weren't team players. And and that's hard, but there may be some exceptions at time that there's a problem that could be solved by a person working in a corner somewhere, but rarely have I have I seen this. Most of the time you get you achieve more by having constructive conversation with colleagues who who will who be supportive and 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 feel that they're they're in this with you. And and I don't know, there might be exceptions to that, but I feel when you have a team like this. Goodness me, you go far. And then people don't. It's about people will will naturally put the extra go the extra mile when needed. You don't have to ask. And if people start clocking in and clocking out too casually all the time, then maybe it's there's something not quite as exciting for them. Now you'll never do that for everyone. And and as you're growing in a bigger, bigger company, that it, it 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 gets a little bit more diluted. But ultimately. You've got to try to get that within teams because it's so much more fun. And if you don't have the fun in there, it's people are just going to be a bit. And I think COVID has not been good for creativity because we've all been working in our little, you know, in homes like this. And it's, you don't have those chance conversation and those, you know, I, I make a point at work to, to loiter around, uh, around the coffee machine regularly because then people come in and out and and then you have a little bit conversation like conversation there and people come into another conversation and it's just I, I feed off that so much in and I think there was those kind of you have to orchestrate some of these too much when it's online. But ultimately if you've got very motivated people, they're fun to work with. That's when the, the whole team rises and, and produces more. So for me it's it's that it, it there are probably many routes to success, but I like that. I like working with people with energy. That, that makes sense. I think the one thing that uh, I've struggled with a bit, I, I agree hundred percent on the you know person can be extremely talented, but if they're not, they just don't know how to work within the context of a team it's it's sort of useless. It sort of negates the entire talented part of the equation. Unless you know, there's you know, some exceptional scenario where that one lone sort of genius or, or can can make a huge difference, I'm, I'm sure. But in general, I I think you're right. But the thing I've struggled with is uh, there. It's obviously quite easy to identify that post fact, post the interview process, and you're hiring them. So one of the things I've started to do a lot, and I don't know if you know if you're a believer in this or not, but you know I've started to move away from the con concept of interviews and I'm much more um, uh, an, uh, sort of an advocate of, of auditions because frankly speaking, you know, it's fairly easy for me to know if somebody is a good, you know, software developer or not in a particular programming language or something like that, that, that isn't that hard to really get to the bottom of. But um, what is really difficult to know is how will that person or that individual perform in the context of the team that he or she operates in and that's where i um i think the audition really helps but you know what are some of the ways that you can solve for that problem because it could be a very painful problem to for, solve for 
after the fact. And sometimes it's not even very obvious after the fact that they're not team players. You find out, you know, because some of them, some some people can be can also honestly be just devious about things, right? So it takes take it may take months before you find out. So how how do you solve for that problem? Well, firstly, I've got to say I love your your concept of an audition. I'm going to use this. <laughs> I love this because you're right. It's putting someone on the spot. We we do that with the more senior people, senior hires. Is get them to give us a presentation and and talk about. It. And then you hear about something they've done. How much passion comes through? You can see that a lot more. But we we often don't do this um, for for the uh, people who are earlier in their careers and. And it would be good to see because I find that if you can't convey that your excitement about a role, then maybe that's not the right role for you, kind of thing. Especially when I think the roles are exciting. I think if if it was a really dull job they hire someone for, then fair enough. But not when when it's something that that should really excite the the interviewee. It, one of the things that that I felt over the years has helped is at the interview stage is to have the, the people who've, who've done the interview and been in, in contact with the person that the interviewee is to get a person that did not take part in a different team to listen and be the person that they, people have to convince to hire this person. It's interesting what that person can spot in people's hesitation at times and so on. And it's like, Oh yeah, well I'm not sure about this, but but they were really good at solving the problem. Thinking, okay, why weren't you sure about this? And trying to kind of do it just enough to try to pick out this, and it's also not bad for unconscious bias having another person listen to what you're saying and thinking, hmm, okay, is that just more samey because you're comfortable here, or is it, is, or 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 this person make you uncomfortable? Why is that? You know, it's just trying to to do this, and it, it's not. It's not necessarily foolproof, but it it does actually get a slightly different dimension because it's not just everyone who's who's seen that person. You've got to try to kind of convince a, another person too. But anyway, there's lots of different techniques of different companies have different yeah. approach for hiring, and I'm not yeah. sure that people have necessarily hit it right all the time. But I'm a firm believer that. People who really want a role and and show a lot of enthusiasm and interview, um, you know, the the chances that that they'll be successful is so much higher. Um, yep, it, that, that's a fair point. Yep. Um, just getting going back to one of the topics we've touched on a little bit, but uh, you know, AI is obviously very much in the zeitgeist at the moment, particularly with the uh, GPTs and, and chat GPT being rolled out last week. I mean, I'm, um, you know, working on AI based products myself in, in the healthcare space. It's definitely an area that's of, of, of high interest to me, but in general, um, you know, uh, what, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges in AI at the moment, particularly as we start talking about its applications in some of the more cutting edge work that's being done, right? Like the kind of work that you're doing. Uh, what are the big challenges and how do you think we, you know, what are some of the key indicators that those challenges are starting to get solved? You know? I think part of the issue is people believe that if you have data, AI will help, like almost kind of blindly. And the, a lot of it, it depends on what the questions are that you want the, the problem to solve. And, and mainly the, the best success of AI to date have been for bounded problems. So if you can have a bounded problem, AI should be pretty good at doing the job, whatever technique you use, because ultimately it's a fine, essentially it's a kind of a finite pool of potential solution that you're you're looking for patterns or you're looking for new ways and and then you know even in the world of NLP where a lot has happened in the last few years and we are doing stuff like this at Babylon that you you there's words are still kind of it's still a finite number of, of words and and that's why a lot of the 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 the, the modern techniques now and in deep learning and so on have 
managed to do some progress even in NLP and so on. But when you're talking about, okay, what's the, the next chemistry, that's something that we're looking at, the main problem that we have is that where do you where do you look? Where will that come from? Where's the information coming from? Have you got to first catalog and have ontologies of, of, of everything? And if so, you know, where do you tap into for that information? Is it something that you have to create? And so that the, these don't exist, you know, or, or if they start to exist, absolutely, you can start to put questions to them. But a lot of time, you have to create the environment on which you can then do your AI. And I think that's where people often skip because they didn't see, they didn't see that Google, when it first started and doing queries, it, it had lots, like they hired what, 10,000 people at one point, just tagging text and so on, so that the algorithm could learn. You know, this is, there was a massive investment. It didn't just do it by magic. They had lots and lots and lots of manual effort behind the scenes to train algorithms and, and find what's important, what's not important, and so on. So it's it's I think people expect expect things that to arrive quicker than it will with the AI world because of that, because they see some improvements in one area and they think, well, if you can do it there, you can do it anywhere. Well, not necessarily. And and maybe, but there's probably some groundwork that needs to be done. There's some, there's some, you know, maybe we need to create more data or we get access to that data or a data feed that is you know, cleaner or, or more um, useful. And in, in other areas, it's a, a great understanding of the physical phenomena because my background having come from essentially modeling, which is very much trying to see what the physical world does. You realize that actually often these sort of white box model where you you mix um sorry the gray box model where you you mix uh, sort of understanding the physical world with ai then you you often start to bound that problem and then you start to be able to solve it so i, I know I'm, i seem to be rambling on this but for for, for me in the in the sort of material science and trying to do something with AI, it's absolutely trying to, can we have a small enough problem? Can we bound it so that we're not trying to boil the, o the ocean and, and gain, gain an understanding of a, a certain chemistry or a certain um, reaction um, that will then inform what other dopants we could use, for example, and just doing this I think we're years away. We have to start now. And there are some baby steps happening, as I said, but we are probably a few years away to do this much more um, uh, from, from a perspective of being a bit more open and, and explore areas that we hadn't thought about before. Now, the optimization at, at a granular level, I think that AI will be better doing this than the more exploratory area. But we're seeing this in, in pharma, industry and a lot of the it the the advances of ai and pharma have been because we've been a greater understanding of and you're not trying to solve every single problem you're trying to understand what might be a, a space in which you're you're looking at for either a a new uh, molecule for your drug to to address or or repurposing something from one area to another by using the properties that you know, but it's there's there has to be a bounding problem. Yeah, I think you know drug discovery is probably a very good parallel in terms of how AI has been leveraged there and trying to see if some of those same principles can be applied towards material science, for example. But uh, um, at some level, I feel like even that you know naturally is a little more bounded than than when you talk about real world atoms and molecules that uh, operate in very very varying conditions because you know the human body and, and and the human genome at some level has you know yes it has uh, a, a lot of variation but you know it's it's still a little more bounded than than what you're dealing with you know um fair enough i i also 
um, you know, wanted to get your take on, you know, particularly given given you know your your role now and and what Cirrus is trying to do. Obviously, you know, um, hydrogen fuel cells maybe you know one part of of um, of the solution to what's really the biggest challenge that faces humanity today in terms of getting to a sort of a carbon neutral world. That's ideally where where we want to be. Um, and but I'm sure there are other areas that um, th that need large problem solving as well. So if you're talking to an audience that is interested in in the space in general, what are some of the other areas that you think um, we need to be looking at and perhaps you know shaping our careers into? Because I think you need talent in a lot of different areas to to get anywhere close to that point in in a in a relatively sane time frame. Yeah. Uh, in <sighs> It's a difficult one to answer because there are so many areas that we need to go and do at the same time. So to me, if if I can recommend a book, would be Bill Gates' book on um, how to avoid a climate disaster. Now, it's maybe 18 months old, the book, something like this. Um, maybe a bit more, I lose track now. Um, but one of the good, I feel good, the good take home points that I felt in this book was that we've got to be careful about um, adopting an interim step um, on towards climate, to, towards being completely um, uh, carbon free that reduces say our carbon uh, footprint, but somehow kind of gets us into a, an uncomfortable place that we, we, we don't really want to move from there. And that's, it's often counterintuitive, but what I was describing about the technology that that we're doing, I'm saying it can be a transition technology because ultimately, if you have pure hydrogen, you have no carbon emission at all. That's a, a transition technology. What's difficult is when you're doing something saying, well, at the moment we're we're you know, encouraged to move all to electric vehicles. That's great. The problem is we need to solve our manufacturing of those cars because at the moment especially the the batteries i would say yeah, batteries the supply is chain. one of the number one area right because we will do more and more green electrons via um the the um, wind turbines or, or solar and so on the price goes down all great but we need to store that energy somewhere either to use in our cars at high density, or it could be much less density, but it, it needs to be stored in order to be able to allow us to function 24 seven in, in all the different countries. So this, this idea of, of storing this energy is super important, but how we produce this energy, we need to look at every single way. We need to have solar concentrators on one end. We, I think you need nuclear. I know it's controversial, but I think you need nuclear probably in a small uh, modular reactors so that they are they're they're more self-contained and, and cheaper to produce. But ultimately, we need a few backup solution, and there's a lot of emotion with, with nuclear, but it's actually quite safe, really. Overall, yeah. coal kills so many more people. No, it has killed so many people. In the if you look at all the nuclear disasters in coal. Coal is much worse. So, but we don't see it that way because one is a you know, they're point disasters, and the other one that happens, you know, it just kills you over time. And and uh, but there's a lot of people who suffer and have suffered over years uh, with this. So, we we do need to have to to be careful about our our emotions with with technologies and be quite an open mind yeah. and see that to get to where we want to get to. There's many different um, technologies that we need to go after. We need to change our behaviors as well. But we certainly, from a technology perspective, we shouldn't rule out anything. And anything. I love the, the fact of using seaweeds instead of plastic um, to, to, make, to make wrappers. Now, that's superb. You know, can we do more bio things that are really biodegradable and, and don't harm our, our um, environment? Or a plastic that can then be chemically changed into something and reused and then have sustainable like this circular economy we need to look at every single aspect of that and that's why i think it's it's ideally you want more engineers you know, yeah. roughly speaking because they can 
they can tune to whatever you know engineering is a is a degree as you know that you learn to learn right you yeah. learn many things and you learn to learn and you're not afraid of tackling the next thing to learn and yeah. having people with a broad it's like getting a pretty good tool set and then and a lot of engineers are so good you know a lot of the the um the startups are, are from you know the ideas come from very bright engineers who just want to change the world and and it just gives you maybe more impetus and and the, the belief that you can do it by having those yeah. skills so you know i i really think now i read somewhere something like the the us gdp would if there was 30 it's something like 30,000 more um lawyers it would go down by 5% but if you had 30,000 more engineers it'd go up by yeah. 5%. You know, it is it's just by by definition engineers do, you know, they, they make yeah. things happen. And and that's yeah. where I feel, you know, that includes chemists, physicists, you know, we need all of them, but people who will just make make it happen. Yeah, I think you know there's I this got to be a whole slew of different techniques and things that we have to look at, right? I mean, I remember when I was finishing business school actually one of the businesses that i was considering starting and i spent almost six months to a year looking at it um was just uh algae-based biofuels right like it seemed like a very uh promising option i mean i think the issue with algae just turned out to be that at scale you start seeing contamination and things like that so what we were considering is more of a distributed way of using algae um in 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 homes and such but you know it seemed far fetched but frankly speaking you know at this point everything probably deserves a look at i mean ultimately i think you know controlled fusion might be everyone's dream but you know there is there is we'll get there but you know it's just it's it's um uh, it's it's going to require um sort of bold leadership and 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 thinking as well um now fair enough so in terms of you know, you know, people that are starting their careers today, if they're in college today and, and um, you know, looking at um, where they should focus their energies, right? Like which part of engineering or which which field or anything like that, do you have, you know, is there, a, you know, is there an area that you think, you know, you do this, it just opens up a lot of options for you? Are there specific areas that you think are more useful than others? But I, I, I do wonder, but I, I think... What is great is to have people loving different aspects, and therefore, it's a it, it is it is good that people choose different areas so that they can they can bring in an expertise from one side and work with someone with a different expertise. But I would say that I I love some of the courses where they've started to really bring more. They, they make they force you to do something more um, general. And and because I think it then it goes back to my original point of arm arming you with the right tools. And if you specialize too early, then maybe you lack the confidence of a, a attacking in a different area. Whereas when you've done a quite a broad degree um, before you specialize, I think it just gives you the the, the grounding in a lot of the, a, a lot of the, the, these different areas. But I'd certainly. I would certainly advocate doing a lot of data processing like you're doing in, in AI because that applies now roughly to so many different areas and, and also gives you a good an opportunity to, to to understand it, even if that's not what you, you do yourself and you team up with others, knowing what it can do and how you can push the boundaries is useful. So don't get afraid of doing more math. <laughs> Because I think it's once you once you learn it, you can you know it's not difficult and you can move on. But I feel sometimes people are slightly stuck in a sort of a fear of something rather than just saying, okay, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna feel like go. That, yeah, and I somehow feel like that starts relatively early on. So like I'm seeing that you know, I have three girls and the. The middle one is just naturally good at math. The older and the younger have to work on it a bit. And somehow I've, it becomes really important to make them realize that, hey, this is this is not something to fear. This is just something to, you know, it may take you 
uh, you may, you, you may, your brain might be wired a different way. You, you're, you may understand the same concept in a slightly different way. Everyone doesn't learn the same way. So, but it is important nonetheless to conquer that fear and figure out what your learning methodology is because it's just the foundation for everything else, like whatever you do, right? It's as much of arguably a, 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 a bigger foundation than any language, whether computer or human that you can learn, right? And uh, I think it's just something I think parents um, and teachers have to start looking out for at a very young age, because if not, my fear is you get to a, you know, get further down the line and that fear is already set in. It's very hard to rewire at that point, you know? Um, I could have said it better. Yeah. yeah. Um, just in terms of, um, you know, just you, you in general seem like a, you know, a, a very optimistic person. That's the read I get when whenever I speak to you. But, you know, I just want to get a t your your take, particularly given the last two or three years where, We've seen so much in this world, right? We've seen a pandemic. You know, we're on the um, cusp of what might, you know, is, is looking more and more like a climate disaster in some sense. There's ge geopolitical issues. Obviously, the economy is going through worldwide, um, a very difficult period. Uh, does that change your perspective in terms of the future that lies ahead? Or, or do you think, you know, regardless of all of this, we are, you know, going to come out of this a decade from now? Um, you know, two decades from now, into a better into a better world. Like, what what are your general views of, of where things are and and where we are headed, and and how to perhaps optimize towards a positive outcome? It's a difficult one, isn't it? Because there are so there are days where I feel completely, oh my goodness, you know, what's going to happen, and and we're not doing something enough, and it, and I I think if you don't have this fear of of the climate disaster that is looming. We, we're not going to get to the solutions. Clearly, we haven't up till now. And it, there's something in our psyche that often says, well, it's someone else. Someone else will solve it. Not necessarily someone else's problem, but like, oh, it's so it's so complicated. I'm so glad others are looking at it. Well, at some point, you've got to say, well, no, we, we all have to look at this. And I don't want to be too negative because ultimately we need we need the next generation to to feel that they can solve this and that they can help us solve this, even though we created it and generations prior to us have created it. And I feel that unless you have some optimism for finding solutions, it's getting through that process, which is difficult and, and long, and we, know we need to get there, it, it will be too difficult somehow. So I don't want to be too negative, although at times it's really easy to, to be negative, and it's really easy to almost say, well, why is someone else, another generation will deal with it, but we can't. We really have got to stop ourselves. Yeah, we can we can that. push the can down the road. I think frankly exactly. speaking, at some at some level, until maybe our generation until about 20 years ago, we could probably have given humanity a pass in the sense that we just didn't know enough about what we were doing to to yeah. um, to our ecosystem. But I think now that we do, now that the blinders are off. You know it's important to course correct, right? Because I think if we don't, we're um, we're just um, you know it's 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 not it's not going to work. I think we we have to we have to act now. There's there's no question on that. Um, and now in terms of just you know I know you you recommend the Bill Gates book, but are there any other books or documentaries or anything that you'd recommend either as it relates to climate change or or the environment, but also in in terms of you know just being a great leader or somebody that wants to get into you know competitive but high performance engineering fields and things like that are the are the things that you would recommend yeah i i i read quite an eclectic uh, range of stuff but i i would say the the book factfulness i don't know whether you've read this by hans Riesling, but it, it it did an amazing ted talk unfortunately he died maybe two years ago or close I to that. I think you've mentioned him before. I think you mentioned the TED yes. Talk. I don't remember the book. Yeah. You know? yeah. It, yeah, factfulness. And the reason I mentioned that is one of the things that is so interesting is it explains how our psyche gets hung up on some, on some facts. And then we're really, we anchor ourselves to this and we're finding it difficult to move away from that. And I know climate change is, is one of those things, depending on your age, you have a maybe a different view of it. And it's hard to move away because you're still using 
essentially data that is outdated and and making decisions on old stuff. And it's interesting to see how our brain naturally does that. So we shouldn't blame people for doing this. We should just be aware and therefore force ourselves to actually look again at facts. And that, that's what the book essentially teaches us through. It's quite humorous and in a good way. And it doesn't make you feel bad. It just informs you. But I, it's these kind of book to me are books that everyone should read. You know, it's a sort of thing that under, it makes you understand how you reason and how you make decisions. And that applies to your everyday life and applies to work. It applies to what should the grand challenges be. And you know, our, it and it it just shows that sometimes we 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 react emotionally and not based on the facts. Um, and we do that for a number of reasons. But to me, the, these kind of books um are the ones that I would thoroughly recommend people read. And therefore it 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 gives you, you, know, you should always at one point, you know, even though you're quite convinced about something to let other people try to, to show you uh, maybe there's another way or maybe, maybe you're not right and, and be open-minded. And that's, that's hard. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's hard it's, when you're opinionated. It is ex <laughs> but it's it's extremely hard. It is extremely hard. And I think, uh, you know, you need to, if you can do that, it becomes a super problem. All right. If you can figure out how to, you know, literally for, for some period of time, shut your biases down, shut your opinion down and just listen to somebody else and their perspective and keep a balanced view. I, I think that's that's definitely a superpower. That's not easy to 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 do, but again, not something easy. that I think <laughs> needs to be cultivated. But anyways, it's uh, it was gr great, great talking to you, Caroline. We'll mention the books in 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 the in the show notes and provide links to it as well. Um, but I really, really enjoyed um, as as always talking to you. And uh, you know, when ne the next time we meet, hopefully we do it in person. But uh, um, I think we we um, definitely got um, got a lot of I personally at least got a lot of value out of this, and I'm sure the the audience will as well. And uh, yeah, if there is um, anything that you, as a parting note, want to want to 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 you know, if there's an action item that you want everyone to go out and do, please feel free to say it now. But you know, would love for you to to be on in the future as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it it's been you know a pleasure as always talking to you, Sadek, and and yeah, and. If anyone, yeah, you know, just even got one bit of of inspiration from this, then great. Um, it you never know when you're talking to people what happens, but I certainly hope that people have an open mind and just want to to be curious and like working with other people and put some energy. And to me, that's they're gonna go far. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you very much, and thank you again for your time. We'll we'll catch up soon. Take care, and have a good uh, 2023 as well. Thank you very much. You too. Bye-bye.